Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As you probably heard by now, SpaceX's DM2 mission turned into a high-profile scrub after the weather did not cooperate. Yeah, I mean, we had great launch coverage of everything from suiting up, getting tested, driving to the pad, getting into the vehicle with the help of the SpaceX ninjas, but the whole thing turned out to be one very elaborate wet dress rehearsal. I mean, very wet. There were some massive storms blowing through. At one point, there was actually a tornado warning in effect. And as we get very close to the launch, when they had to call the go, no go, the weather people said, if you could give us 10 more minutes, we could launch. But no, they violated constraints. And the constraints were largely down to the probability of lightning related to electric field strength at the ground. Now, obviously, this is very disappointing for everyone that was wanting a launch, but we'll get another launch attempt in a couple of days. And really, this was all about the crew's safety, which is of tantamount importance. This is a lot of launch with crew on board has stricter safety criteria than a regular uncrewed launch. Although, to be fair, I believe that the uh, lightning criteria that blocked this launch would have blocked a regular launch as well. So I want to talk about the extra safety conditions that are applicable to the, the crewed flights. The extra hardware that they need, the new f rules, uh, everything like that. Because I think it's there's a lot to learn about why this launch is going to work the way it will. So let's just start with the weather rules. And NASA actually produces this very nice uh, explanation of the rules. So, first of all, winds. They're not allowed to launch if the winds are greater than 30 miles an hour, you know, essentially at the height of the rocket. And then they're not allowed to launch into upper level winds if there's excessive wind shear. And that means, you know, the winds at up high altitudes can be very fast. And they can also change between different levels. And that's when it gets very dangerous. If a rocket is going up very quickly and it moves from one zone into another, it will have a sudden acceleration from one direction to the other. Even though it might be moving supersonic, when that wind hits it and changes direction, it can hammer the rocket and cause problems. The next 10 criteria that are on this sheet are all about avoiding lightning. And of course, this dates back to 50 years ago with the launch of Apollo 12 and the famous call out by John Aaron, try SCE to aux, the, you know, the obscure switch in the command module which saved the mission. But lightning has actually caused the loss of rockets. In 1987, a launch called AC-67, Atlas Centaur 67, carrying a Navy satellite, it had been waiting for the weather to break and the control team decided to attempt launching through a 5,000 thick la foot thick layer of cloud. And as the rocket flew through the cloud layer, it generated lightning through its, you know, obviously its structure and the long exhaust trail. And that electrostatic discharge hit the computer, caused uh, memory corruption, and that memory corruption caused the booster to just hard gimbal its engines over. They figured this out because the rocket was less than a minute into its flight, and they actually recovered the flight computer and were able to check the status of its uh, memory. And again, to be clear, these criteria apply to all launches regardless of what the payload is. The final set of criteria are specific for missions where you can you know, shake hands with the payload, assuming that you're not doing the whole social distancing thing. And these are all about the abort recovery zones. If there is a problem during launch and the ca you know, crew capsule has to separate and land in the ocean, they need to be able to recover it. And if the weather conditions downrange are not suitable, if they would be falling into a hurricane with extremely high waves and they would be unable to be recovered, then then they would scrub the launch. And this was absolutely a concern for today's launch attempt. There was a tropical storm sitting close enough to the um, you know, launch track that there was a possibility it could have affected things. Ultimately, it was the lightning conditions at the launch site that scrubbed it. So that brings us to the abort processes. And we've already talked about aborts in the Falcon 9. We had that marvelous test back in January where we got to see an entire rocket booster blow up after the in-flight abort test. So SpaceX had demonstrated the ability to abort from the launch pad and to abort at max Q, but they had to have abort details figured out for the entire launch timeline. 
and there is actually a timeline out there you can look at it, it goes down to the second and the abort modes are listed as you know stage 1a stage 1b stage 2a so on and so forth right so the difference is there's two abort modes in stage one the first one is for the first minute and 15 seconds you're going to use the draco thrusters super draco sorry to escape from the rocket and then after that you pop the service module and then when you're descending you deploy the parachute now once they get further into the flight and higher up, they want to start using the regular low thrust Draco thrusters to orient the capsule for descent. There's a bit of a lag between being able to use the Super Draco abort motors and the regular Draco thrusters. They use the same fuel supply, but they need to be at different pressures. So after the Super Dracos fire, they blow down the pressure and then the regular Dracos can be used. So that's the procedure used for the rest of stage one. And then in stage two, there are five different abort modes. So right after second stage separation and all the way up to eight minutes and five seconds into the flight, which is the majority of the second stage burn, the, the capsule will come down somewhere along the North American coast. And that starts all, obviously down in Florida, all the way up past the Northeast and includes Canada. You've got Nova Scotia and all the way up into Newfoundland. Somewhere along there, that's relatively close to the coast for recovery. As I understand it, because they're much higher up and the aerodynamics aren't an issue and because the second stage isn't going to make quite as big a boom, the Super Dracos don't fire for as long, so they have performance left over. So they will use this to actually try to pick a specific landing spot along the coast where the weather is cooperative and there are recovery forces available. I believe that's what happens. So after this... They are the trajectory would carry them further than Newfoundland, all the way into a region which is marked on the map as the downrange Atlantic exclusion zone. They don't want to end up in here because this is far from land, it has big waves, terrible weather, and there's no recovery zones, uh, your crew or anything there. So at 8 minutes and 5 seconds, it switches over to the second abort mode, and after separation, it has to apply braking thrust to slow itself down so that it lands within this region. It's going about 20,000 kilometers per hour, and it needs to use the Super Dracos to slow down fast enough that it is, doesn't end up in the middle of the Atlantic. So that continues up to 8 minutes and 28 seconds. After that, they switch to abort modes uh, 2C, and... At that point, they've got enough velocity that if they get a little extra push, they can make it all the way across the Atlantic to a landing zone just south of Ireland. This is actually called the Shannon landing zone because probably the recovery forces would be staged out of Shannon Airport in Ireland. So yeah, for that 10 seconds of flight, if they had an abort, they would use the thrusters to push them further and they would end up in Europe. And so finally, following that, there's another shorter zone which lasts six seconds. And that at that point, they have enough velocity to make over the Atlantic. And in fact, if they kept going, they would land in continental Europe. Since they don't want to land on land, they then use the thrusters to slow them down and hit the Shannon abort zone. Finally, in the very last second, there is an abort mode classified as 2E, and this is essentially abort to orbit. This is where there's some problem with the shutdown of the engine, and they didn't quite get into the correct orbit. At this point, they have enough time to trim the orbit with the Draco thrusters, and then depending upon the orbit they are in and the fuel margins they have, they might potentially proceed with the mission, or more likely, the next chance they have to return to the Earth, they will use that. Okay, so for the third and final safety feature I want to talk about is the spacesuits that the crew have to wear. And, you know, when the SpaceX spacesuits appeared, a lot of people were very excited. They were like, this is fashion finally getting into space. This looks amazing. And, of course, you know, we have the original pictures and then we have the pictures of Doug and Bob with their dad bods. And you know, it doesn't quite look as compelling. And you know, to be fair, these guys are in fantastic shape, but they're not in the same shape as the mannequin. So these are suits that you absolutely don't want to have to use. Obviously, you're going to wear them for safety purposes, but if they are ever needed to keep you alive, you're in a dangerous situation. They are there just in case the cabin loses pressure during any of these phases. They want to keep the crew alive, but the... Um, the suits don't have the level of flexibility that is required for a regular EVA suit. They couldn't go outside and fix the spacecraft. 
They're designed to operate from a life support umbilical that's attached to their right thigh. And if you look on the left thigh, they have an iPad there that has all their checklists. When I did my video on NASA's new EVA suit, a lot of people just didn't get the distinction between an EVA suit, an extra vehicular suit for outside the capsule, and an IVA suit, which is entirely for use when you're sitting inside a failing capsule that has no air pressure. Perhaps the best example of the lack of flexibility these suits offer is when, that great moment when Bob and Doug got out of their Teslas and they're standing at the foot of the Falcon 9 and they're looking up. And to look up, they had to lean their entire body backwards because the helmet doesn't move. If you look at the Russian design, the so-called suits, they have a fabric kind of helmet that comes over, so they can actually unzip this and take it down. But in the case of SpaceX's suit, the helmet is more or less fixed on when they're in the suiting up room, and they can't raise their head backwards to look up. But none of this matters, because the suits are there to keep the crew alive in an emergency. They're not designed to make the crew look cool. After all, it's very hard to look cool when you are being outclassed by a squadron of elite SpaceX pad ninjas. So after the scrub, the next launch attempt will be on Saturday. There's no launch window on Thursday or Friday because the space station would be too far from the launch site and the rendezvous would take so long. Um, the other backup option is going to be Sunday, but I'm hoping by then we don't have to worry about that. I will see you then either way. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs> <laughs>